Look at him, folks. For those folks watching on YouTube, there he is. He's a published author right now. <laughs> he is also John Sherman. Congratulations, big guy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's been a, lot, a while since we last spoke. So uh, when we were texting yesterday, I was I was glad to hear you had an open spot so we could chat again. It's been too long. <laughs> are you kidding? I still wear my uh, my t-shirt you sent me all the way back in 2016. Yeah. Uh, for the folks who haven't listened, we've been going for a while. John. I mean, I found him when he was just putting out some tremendous stuff back in 16. And then there were a couple more outings. And then during the COVID lockdown 2020, we had a podcast, we had a chat. And subsequently, you've uh, got your own podcast. You're putting out great stuff on the, online. You've now published this book. I mean, quickly give us the whistle stop tour for the folks who have not heard from you. Uh, okay. So I, I have been doing practical golf since 2015, which is the website where I try and offer coaching advice from a player's perspective. I guess that's my little unique spin. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, the last few years we, I, I started a podcast with Adam Young, who I know you've had on the show. It's called the sweet right. spot. And that that's been a lot of fun for us. And we're, we're definitely going to have you on soon. And I guess the big news of the day is the last three years, um, I've been working on this, uh, this book here, uh, which is four everything found, called everything. the four foundations of the golf swing folks. It looks like a Bible. And from what I understand, mine's on the way, where can folks find it? Um, you can find it on Amazon. Um, it, this is not no golf swing in this book, Mark. Oh, pardon know. me, the four foundations of golf. That's that's in the first part of the book because I, I make it very clear. This is not a book about the golf swing. It's about everything other than the swing. Um, and I actually mentioned you. You are, now that I can look at it in front of me, you are mentioned in the introduction on the, you're on the like, second page of the book, Mark. I'm, uh, I'm tremendously honored. I'm so not deserving whatsoever, but honored. Listen, I... For the folks who have not heard you on the show or heard your podcast or been to your website or, you know, now they better go and get the book. Um, quickly tell us about you because I, I'm remiss at the mistake I made because the one thing I've always loved about you as a guy who coaches and teaches people to play better, you approach golf, not from necessarily the golf swing thing. It's just about doing certain stuff properly and avoiding other things. So tell us a bit about you, please. So I am not a swing instructor. Um, I'm a golfer and, you know, the, the genesis of what I started on practical golf came from the perspective that, you know, I felt there obvious is plenty of information on the golf swing. I think you and me would, would argue maybe there's too much, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> golfers going on YouTube and Instagram and lots of great info on there, but it, of course you run into irrelevancy issues and, you know, I find a lot of golfers who are stuck in that rut of going from swing tip to swing tip, and they're really not seeing improvement. So I came in saying like, Hey, I've, I've gotten to a pretty high level as a player. Let me share what I've learned from my perspective as a golfer on topics that I think are being ignored. And that's really what the four foundations of golf are is the four topics I, I've focused on, which are expectation management, just letting people understand what they can expect from this game on a shot to shot basis or, or what they want out of golf, you know, really making people happier with the game and more satisfied. Um, I talk a lot about strategy, uh, how to practice effectively. And then my version of the mental game, not, you know, there's plenty of great sports psychologists who have wonderful techniques, but I, I come at it with you know, how can I calm myself down when I'm playing under the gun in a tournament or, if, you know, like a regular golfer gets nervous on their Saturday Nassau match, you know, speak from that perspective. So, yeah, I come at everything as kind of as the player coach, not the swing instructor. Taking a 36,000 foot view of you and, and what you do, I've talked about it a bunch recently, or it sort of comes to mind as, as you highlight the four pillars of you know, um, better golf. Um, you have a, a, a sensational awareness of self and sort of what you're going through when you're playing, because all of the insights you bring, every time I have you on, I'm scribbling notes feverishly. And I've been in golf since Moby Dick was a minnow. <laughs> so I've spoken with all and sundry about this, uh, about game improvement, but you've got this awareness about yourself, which I think everyone listening to this, no matter where their skill station is in the game would behoove themselves if they were that way inclined to. So what say you? Um, well, thank you for saying that. I, the, the, the quote I had from you in the book, what you said to me, um, I believe is the first time you kind of 
saw me and had me on your show, you, you said that I was talking about things that were hiding in plain sight. Yeah. And that was a really important moment for me because someone like you with your history in the game and what you know and, and, and the level as you've achieved, taking note of someone like me was a big deal for me. And that's what I try and continue to do. I, I think there's a lot of things. You know, I think golfers are searching for more complicated answers. They're on the course trying to execute what I would call home run scenarios, <laughs> which is hit all these excellent shots that um, you know we see you talking about on PGA Tour broadcasts. And they're like, I want to do that too. And unfortunately, I don't want to be a bummer about golf, but it, it's you know that this that the the basics of what it takes to get better at this game are. I'm trying to kind of bring those together in one resource, and I draw from a lot of people I've learned from. Um, but getting into the specifics, like when we talk about something like strategy, for example, which I know can lower people's scores overnight, that's not something we're ever taught as golfers. Yeah. No. We're taught the golf swing, but we're not, we're not ever taught, you know, what are appropriate targets with our approach clubs? What are appropriate targets off the tee? And in the book, I try and get into the nitty gritty of that and give very specific examples and, and give people a framework that they can go on the course and make simple decisions that are essentially optimizing your golf game. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to help manage the entire package because it's hard when you go out there, it's, it's confusing. There's a lot of things distracting you. You get nervous you know, you've got the wind, you've got, you know, your playing partners acting a certain way. There's so many things distracting you on the course. And I'm trying to give people the tools to coach themselves through the round. You said it and you use the term coach and here's my mere culpa, right? I taught golf, been teaching golf since 1995. I became a college coach in 2001. And I'll never forget my former coach who hired me here at Columbus State. And I'm subsequently retired from there for broadcast. He looked at me and he said, Mark, you're a fantastic golf instructor. You decorated all the rest. He goes, you're never going to teach these folks good in four years. He goes, you got to coach them to play the game better. And I, at the time, I was like, oh, watch me. I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to improve <laughs> their golf swings and improve their putting strokes, and they're going to get better. And we did, but they were always contending, but never clicked through and won. And then when it, uh, my approach as a coach, not a swing instructor, pivoted to the playing of the game, the understanding of trends, the nuance of emotion and understanding where you are and shot selection, all those sorts of things you talk about. When I pivoted and went that way, that's when the results began to happen. And now I, I, I almost as a golf instructor, right? That's my DNA. I will say to someone, it's intellectually lazy to think you're going to get better by just improving your golf swing. Because I can show you hundreds of guys and girls that have got fantastic golf swings that might be better players, but they aren't fulfilling and achieving their potential. Your Absolutely. Point. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really the phrase that, you know, we often talk about Adam Young and myself is, you know, we're trying to, you're not trying to play golf swing, you're trying to play golf. And I think, and I don't want to be negative about the teaching community because I view instructors as, as a total necessity of this game. You know, the technical aspects of the golf swing are super important and influential in scoring potential. So I don't want to throw that out the window. My contention is similar to what you're saying is that I think we overemphasize that too much. And when golfers take up the game and I do encourage them to get swing lessons, the expectation is they're going to be on the range with the instructor and they're going to get, you know, tips on how to fix their swing. And that absolutely could lower scores. And I'm starting to see a trend that now uh, as the transformation you went through is like, well, what about like reviewing your stats or going over, like, do you have a routine or what target are you picking off this tee shot or just talking about your round and going through your shots and be like, Hey, what happened here? You know, you had a blow up hole. Can we talk about what happened? What was going through your head? What were the strategic decisions? Um, that is essentially what coaching is the, the, from the distinction of instruction. And um, I obsess over that because that's what's taken me from someone who was, you know, I spent 15 years in this game of being a somewhat mediocre, okay-ish player. Um, and I had to make a lot of mistakes over the years to the point where, you know, part of me being a player coach is I better walk the walk. So 
I, uh, I, I don't mean to brag, but I've gotten my handicap down to a plus two. Um, I, I compete in a lot of the biggest amateur events in my area in New York Metro region, which I'm super lucky to be part of. And um, I have put my game to the test and all of these theories and philosophies I have so I can learn more and then dispel it to other golfers. And I'm also paying attention to what's going on with them too. So um, I guess that's, that's why I, I just come out everything from the perspective of player slash coach versus I don't care about the golf swing. It really doesn't interest me. I haven't looked at my golf swing in years. I video it maybe once a year. I have no idea what's going on with it, to be quite honest with you. Well, it's why your book is a bestseller already. And it's only what, three or four days into <laughs> a few days into its release, whatever. It's been uh, a wild ride. <laughs> you know, I as a podcast host to one other podcast host, we shouldn't date this because it lives in the internet. Anyhow, it was released here in, uh, uh, in mid to late June, 2022. Um, the whole thing that, about your book, which I love, it's the four pillars of, um, game improvement um it's very holistic which is sort of who i've become uh, all the long-time listeners to this podcast know that's how i approach the game because there's so much um just the other day i had an experience with a young lady phenomenal golf swing fell straight out of heaven <laughs> would, would go out and find a way to playing beautifully shoot 85 and when we just talked about shot selection and having the golf course come to you and making the golf course help for you and looking for situations like that went from averaging 85 to shooting mid seventies in the space of about two weeks. It's incredible, right? I, I, I truly believe that there is a better version of every golfer waiting. It's just, you kind of have to like scrape away those layers to get to the, I almost view it as like, I, I believe a lot of golfers have some inherent skill and athletic ability and they get in their own way to prevent that from occurring on the golf course. Um, and there is a difference between, you know, the swing and score, of course, because there's a lot more to it, but it's, you know, that, I guess that, that, that is ultimately what coaching is. You, you're, you're accessing people's potential and letting them explore it and access it more on the golf course more efficiently because yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I still get in my own way on the golf course. Sometimes I had a tournament round the other day that was just, I, to be quite honest with you, I was nervous about releasing the book and I wasn't there mentally. Mm -hmm. And I made some really big errors that cost me big time. Um, and it's always a constant reminder that this game requires your presence and your focus and right. your attention. Um, again, at a reasonable level, I don't want everyone you know, going out there trying to break 90 thinking they have to focus like tiger does, but it's all relative to everyone's level. And that's, I guess, what I'm trying to communicate is like, I want to give you the tools for what you want out of golf. Um, what I want out of it might be different than someone else who's playing, you know, once or twice a month and that's okay. All right. Let's tease slash coach people. Um, you're going to share some insights from each one of the four cornerstones. Um, mm -hmm. The book is divided into four sections. Again, just as a reminder, expectation management strategy, practice, and the mental game. So Correct. let's start with the expectation management. Go there a little bit, please, John. So I, I think one of the big things that we struggle with as golfers is that we don't have a good understanding of what a quote unquote good golf shot is. And I hope you don't interpret this as me picking on you because you are a PGA tour broadcaster and you do a fantastic job. I, I love that. Whenever I watch uh, you on TV or listen to you on TV, I always go to my, my kids don't really like golf that much, but I'm like, daddy knows that guy. And they're like, Oh yeah, great. Dad. No, no one cares. <laughs> um, but I have a whole chapter called the PGA tour fallacy. And, and the genesis of that is, and I, I believe I've spoken to you about this on your podcast before is that, you know, when we watch tour players on broadcasts, we're not being shown the full story, right? We're not being shown the guys or the girls who are missing the cut and shooting 78, 74. We're not being shown all their shots. Of course, we want to be entertained. So we're going to be shown, you know, the best players who are playing the best at that moment. So we're seeing a lot of putts from 25 feet get trained. Um, we're seeing a lot of great approach shots that settle near the pin and, one of the things I try and unravel in the book is just showing a few stats from the PGA tour and for regular golfers, just to understand like, Hey, if you're 150 yards away on the fairway, cause I see this all the time. Someone will hit it to like 30 or 40 feet. And they're like, Oh, that wasn't good. And I'm like, that was a PGA tour quality shot. You know, you just being on the putting surface 
is excellent. Pat yourself on the back for that. Um, I just think that, again, we're never, when we learn this game, we're either learning it from a teaching pros perspective, which is swing oriented, or we're playing a bad game of telephone with our golfing buddies, right? <laughs> so we're, we're hearing things about, oh, you know, you want to land this 10 feet beneath the pin. So you have an uphill putt. And I'm like, that's just absurd. No one can do that. You yeah. know, no, no one can reasonably control a golf ball that much, not even the tour players. Um, so I, I spend the first section of the book talking about statistics um, and various, even stories of my own blunders on the course, just to give people being like, Hey, you know, let's say you're a 15 handicap and you drove it 230 yards in the rough and you had a clear path to the green. That's a good tee shot. That's a good outcome. Mm -hmm. If you hit a seven iron and let's say you didn't even hit the green in regulation, but you had a very straightforward, maybe 15 to 20 yard pitch slash chip shot with plenty of green in between you and the pin, that's a good outcome. You've reduced your chances of making a double bogey. Um, so there's all these events on the course that I think we gloss over and I see people losing their temper on these shots when in fact, these are good outcomes and you should pat yourself on the back. And if you do, I believe it actually can then work wonders for the mental game because now you're in a more positive state of mind rather than I used to be a golfer who is dissatisfied with every shot. And I, I see plenty of them still who are like that. And it's, it's just not a way that you can access your potential, in my opinion. It's so, it's so appropriate. And I want to mine here a little bit more. First off, you, you talked about the PGA Tour fallacy. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that's not. I hope that's not condescending to no, the tour. Not, not at all, because it's so appropriate. Because I had a heated conversation with a colleague over dinner a couple weeks ago, and the conversation was Rory McIlroy, arguably the most gifted golfer currently playing, in my opinion, by uh, far and away. I, I would agree with you too. And, and everyone will say, you got a Rory man crush. And I'll be like, unabashedly, yes, I do. Because I get to call this guy and watch what he does. And, and he is gifted. Um, and, and the the expectation from announced folks and from viewers is that with a wedge in hand, Rory's weak. Well, no, that that's the fact, right? And yes, he is subpar. But then the expectation is, well, Rory has to hit the ball inside of 10 feet every time he has a wedge in hand which is ludicrous, even at yeah. that level, okay? PGA Tour averages, the best on the tour is 15 feet from 100 to 125 exactly. yards on average. So so that's so uh, when the announcer goes, well, he should hit this inside 15 feet. In certain situations, absolutely. Mm -hmm. If you've got a very receptive flag, no wind, all that sort of stuff. But you, I, I'm on the course, bad lie, crosswind. You're not so sure about your swing. If you hit it to 25 feet, if you're Rory, that's pretty good as long as you've got a legitimate look. Then I've started to see Rory trending in the right direction with a wedge game and the iron game to build on that. And I said, Rory might not be hitting it close, but he's hitting it better because I'm watching him change shot shapes. He's going harder. He's going softer. He's flatting balls left, right, right, left. And I'm like, watch the space that's going to happen. And then I heard this like, oh, he's got to change this and the ball spinning too much and all this sort of stuff. Lo and behold, he puts on a wedge display in Canada. That was a very special performance. He missed a few of those short putts that broke my heart. Thank God he won that, right? That would have been heartbreaking when he missed a few of those three footers on those wedge shots. Yeah. So again, time context, this is 20 <laughs> made in open. Um, and to me, I see Rory now, and maybe this fits into the expectation. This is what I, where I want your commentary. He's not hitting the shot and hitting it to 25 feet and being despondent. He's more hitting a shot to craft something a certain way, like to hit a little softer with a little baby draw and have it hit and release or hit it harder and higher with some fade spin to get it to settle down. So he's getting into the craft of creation as opposed to the expectation of, dang, my wedge game has sucked so bad. I've got to hit this thing close. And I feel like to your mental game observation, John, it's almost freeing him up. And the more this is happening, the more he's starting to hit good shots again with the wedges. And, and I think what's interesting about that is, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, because everyone listening to this is in the situation. Well, I want to get from, you know, a 15 to a 10. What does that look like for me? So for Rory in the world he lives in, he's trying to win majors. He's trying to be number one in the world. He needs to figure these things out. And 
of course, he's a phenomenal wedge player in every sense of it, but he's up against the best. So, you know, perhaps it's better strategic decisions or choosing shots that are more appropriate for the situations he's in. And then he can put less pressure on himself. I see a little bit more freedom out of him also. Now for a normal golfer, um, I would say that that situation might look like, okay, you have a hundred yard shot from the fairway and you're staring down that pin and you're thinking that, oh, if I don't land it inside of a 10 foot circle of this thing, like things are not going to go well here. And I believe that puts you, you're already behind the eight ball strategically and mentally. Um, Whereas if, again, one of my goals in the book is if you go into that shot saying, okay, that pin's tucked on the right. I want no part of that. I'm just looking to get it on the putting surface. Mm -hmm. If I do that, even if it's 30 feet away, that's an exceptional outcome for me because I can two putt for par and get out of here and essentially avoid a bogey or a double bogey, which is for everyone listening. That is the path to your lower scores. It is not birdies. I talk about birdies in this section as well. Average golfers, you're making less than a quarter of a birdie per round scratch golfer one to two birdies around at most. And they all tell you, and all the collegians will, they'll come yeah, to form six birdies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've averaged 300 off the tee. And you know? I'm like, please, man. Yeah. I mean, a, a good, around. a good tour player is three birdies around. And most of those are occurring on par fives. Tour average is 4.6 on a par five. And it's slightly above average on a par three and a par four. Yeah. Um, so we're not, when we have that hundred yard wedge shot, a lot of people are like, I'm going to make birdie here. No, you're not. You're going to try and put it on the green and make sure you're not short-sided in that bunker or at least get it in a position where you can have an easy chip or pitch shot and you're not strangling yourself with the expectation of trying to land at 10 feet from the pin. And when you have that type of freedom on the course, and I can tell you this personally, especially when I play in tournaments and stuff like that, I know that in that situation, if I can execute the shot and 25 feet away from the pin is good. That just allows me to go through my routine and let it happen versus me worrying and putting too much of a burden on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And the best golf shots occur, I believe, when you're in a more reactive, passive state versus this, I don't know, fearful. There's there's many adjectives you could throw at uh, how a lot of golfers feel before a shot, but I'm trying to get people to go out there and just you're on autopilot. You're just stepping up, you know, your target, go through your routine, go hit. Um, it all, that's why I I think managing expectations, it bleeds into everything in golf. It bleeds into strategy. It bleeds into practice. It bleeds into the mental game. Um, it's so, so important. And that's why I start off in the book with it. Um, so hopefully that, uh, answered one of your questions there. I went off on a few tangents. Sorry. No, it's, it it certainly <laughs> does. Uh, and folks, that's, you notice how John quickly brought it back from the tour to you. Um, Cause that's who he is. I mean, that t-shirt you released way back in the day, I think it says avoiding double bogeys. It's, at all it's weird. Uh, the tagline of practical golf is they're fighting the war on double bogeys yeah, yeah. because that that's, if you look and you'll see oh, this in the book, if I hope you read it, Um, you will see statistics that show you that the difference between going from a 20 handicap to a five is not about making more birdies. It's about avoiding double bogeys or worse. Um, that's the name of the game. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not swashbuckling pin hunting golf to lower your scores. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four gospels. Okay. Next one. Um, so we've got the expectation management down, um, just strategy. Shot selection. Uh, this is incidentally where we talk about introducing folks way, way back in the day. Um, Scott Fawcett came on the show introducing his decade system. Yep. He's had all manner of success. Yeah. Competitive golfers, notably Will, uh, Will Zalatoris, but you know, collegians and all alike now, just with picking better shots, having a better strategy, not going after you use the term flag hunting. Just, just not being so swashbuckling and writing checks that your body can't cash under pressure. I played with a really strong college player the other day. He's from St. John's, a freshman, um, really good player in a tournament. And I know for a fact he was using decade. I could just tell by the way he was stepping up to the ball and the, the targets off the tee and with approach shots. Uh, Scott's influenced the game. He's influenced my game. I, I, he is the most cited person in my book. Um, Yeah, there's a lot I talk about in the strategy section. I mean, I think one of the big eye-openers for me, 
and a lot of other golfers is the mar- is the work that Mark Brody and Scott have done. Yeah. Um, I think Mark Brody uncovering strokes gained, understanding that distance, you know, there, there's value to distance. I used to approach golf from the, I had it backwards almost actually, I didn't have it backwards. I was very scared and conservative off the tee and I was very conservative with approach shots. So I got one out of two, right. Being conservative with approach shots was optimal, but off the tee, I was always led to believe that short and straight was better. And what I realized was short, meaning taking a four iron off the tee or three wood wasn't that straight. Um, I was not as accurate with those clubs as I thought I was. And I know for a fact, plenty of other golfers aren't either. And on top of that, I was so obsessed with the left to right dispersion that I didn't understand the value of distance. And that's something that Brody and Fawcett have cleared up for the golf world. And I talk about them all throughout this section because um, I, I just wouldn't have figured it out with those two. And, you know, for me, the, the, one of the light bulb moments was Scott sitting me down. And I said, what about, what do I have to do to become a better tournament player? And I'm telling him I'm taking shorter clubs off the tee. He's like, stop it. He's like, you're never going to play well unless you embrace your driver and hit it everywhere possible. Um, and when I really started to understand what strokes gain meant that, you know, 20, 30 yards is worth, you know, for an average golfer, that's worth upwards of a third of a stroke. Um, we discounted distance and we overvalued quote unquote safeness and accuracy. Um, so that's something I, I spend a lot of time talking about as tee shot strategy, because there's a lot of nuance to that. And certainly if you want the most nuance, then I always recommend Scott's system decade. And what I try and do is give golfers, you know, regular golfers, a basic framework that they can go and prepare pick their targets, you know, using whether it's satellite imagery or courses they play and just have the decisions made before they step on the golf course and know that they're confident with the club selection and target off the tee, because that removes burden. And again, gets back to my original point where you step up to that shot and those decisions are made. Now you're not hemming and hawing. You're stepping up, you're going through your routine and you're executing, move on to the next shot. That's what I want. Yeah. Conviction is so important just for, um, just for posterity sex, clarity, even. Um, I'm completely on board with, you know, being aggressive off the tee. But then again, I, and I want your commentary here too, because yes, there is advantage to distance. And I will build on that saying distance control, especially with the iron game too, because Absolutely. more defensive with the irons is highly recommendable, no matter what your skill in the game is or your yep. level of play. But as an on-course announcer, and I'll list great drivers of the ball, Rory, we all know it, Will Zalatoris, Dustin Johnson. If there's a, a shot that they are just not comfortable going with the driver, it's like essentially I'm the coach of the, the, the team and I've got to get that one yard, my football team, I'm going to give the ball to the playmaker. Yep. So I'm going to say to the folks then, this is not a mandate people to go out there and just swing for the fences with your driver. All no, no, absolutely not. We're avoiding double bogeys at all costs, right? But in within reason, be aggressive off the tee. Correct? Yeah, there, there's more, there's far more nuance to it, which is why I wrote roughly 30,000 words on the strategy <laughs> section. And I didn't even cover it all, to be quite honest with you. Um, but yeah, there's... You know, when we when we look at the average player, so the difference between, you know, Will Zalatoris and Joe Weekend Golfer. Will is an incredibly straight driver of the golf ball, has plenty of distance to spare. He could hit, you know, he could show up at any course and hit three iron off the tee and shoot a 63. No problem because he has prodigious length. And he also has tremendous ball striking skills. If he takes a three wood off the tee or, or a long iron, he's going to strike it right on the center of that club face every time. Um, whereas, you know, you talk about a, a, a recreational player, they can't lose that distance mainly because of the approach game. And I talk about this a lot in the book. It says, if you want to figure out the difference between better players and not so great players, start off with a putting contest from 20 feet, you can have a 15 handicap, have a putting contest with one of the best tour putters. Most of them are going to, they're going to two putt most of the time. You're not going to see that much of a difference as you get further and further away from the hole, then you're going to start to see the difference. So if I had a 15 handicap, having an approach shot contest from 180 yards versus a tour player, you know, what would happen? 
Mm-hmm. The tour player would be hitting it, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet from the pin, landing on the green, and the 15 handicap would be duffing a few, hitting a few far to the right. My point is, is that regular golfers, proximity is even more important for them. And Mark Brody proved this. So when you lay back off the tee, when you make that decision not to hit driver, um, that 20, 30 yards costs the less skilled player more than the tour player because the tour player is far more skilled with their irons. And that is where scoring primarily occurs in this game is approach shot play. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I try and I, I'm just trying to make golfers aware of that trade-off. Now, some golfers can't hit their driver straight at all. And my advice to them is, yeah, you might have to keep it in the bag and work on it with the practice methods I'm going to tell you about. Um, but I see so many golfers who are decent drivers and just because they're so scared, they're like hitting irons and fairway woods and it's not leading to lower scores. And I was that player for a long time. And when I started to measure the difference, I did a test where I tested my three wood, which is now out of the bag versus my driver on a launch monitor. My driver was straighter. I hit it farther and straighter. And there's a number of reasons for that in equipment design. We can go into gear effect and MOI between three woods and drivers, but I'm not going to bore with you with that right now. But yeah, but, but here's the thing too. I, I described you as very aware at the top of this conversation. And that's the thing too, because we all perform with such biases unbeknownst to us at times mm-hmm. you're looking if you're watching on youtube yeah john's admitting that he was a scared player i was a tremendously scared player i feel like it held me back um from really competing at the highest level because i was good um and but i was the guy that had learned that you put the ball in play off the tee and so i would always err defensive um and look i had success that way but i was always spotting a little bit extra to the individual that not played rashly, but just was aggressive and took certain tee shots on. Just, just quick, quickly, one more thing. Sure. You, you did the comparison with the, the tour professional and the 15 handicap of putting. I, I don't think the average golfer listening to this or watching this, because we'll get our hair blown back by watching Will Zalatoris drive it or Rory McIlroy or any of these guys, Tiger. I don't think the average golfer watching this realizes how well these guys putt and how important three putt avoidance is, especially if you're not a great iron player and you might hit the green in regulation to 45 feet, but then you take three or four from there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I consider putting a different, I'm not the first person to say this, but I consider putting a different game inside of golf okay. and it, 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 it's a much harder game. It's harder to separate. And what I mean by that, And again, I have to tip my hat to Mark Brody for this Mm -hmm. is that putting is so hard for everyone. A PGA tour make rate. We always defer to this stat is 50% from eight feet. That's, that's kind of the line in the sand. And then you look at a 10, 15 handicap they're you know, getting down to 30% from those distances. So if I had to put putting in a nutshell, how to improve your scores, it's essentially Increase your make rates inside of 10 feet where you actually have a chance of making them. So there's some fruit to be earned or low hanging fruit that you can pick for a lot of players. Mm -hmm. But to your point about three putt avoidance, that is again, one of the traditional stats that does have value in the sense that better golfers just don't three putt as much. And that is mostly speed control. And, and you know, my practice section of the book, I'm saying, you know, I've, I've, gone through a journey of being a very poor putter to what I would consider a decent to good putter now. And I believe most of it was just speed control. I think that's the most important skill for scoring and putting um, because most of your putts are going to be outside of 10 feet and it's a game of proximity. You want to keep it as close as you can to the hole and avoid that three putt. Cause if you keep leaving yourself five or six footers, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I, let's move quickly into the practice thing, but I want to stay where that is. I remember way back in the day when, you know, in South Africa, we played snooker uh, over in the States and billiards and over in the States here, you play pool. And so I came to the States as a collegian and pool was everywhere. And Hmm. once I was frequenting pubs and stuff, but we were playing pool (laughs) and uh, someone said to me, just uh, sort of that really simple sounding wisdom. He goes, just finish the ball close to the hole. He goes, don't try and jam it in there. Just finish it up there close. And it's the same thing with putting. And you use the term proximity. Um, even from 10 feet and in, 
you know, don't say, well, I'm supposed to be making 50% of these from eight feet. And then you rip the thing in the hole. Just allow the hole to play big because you're just trying to end it around the hole there. So the ball topples it on various sides. Because I see so many golfers when they're practicing, they're not working on speed control. They're just trying to make. And they might be working on five footers and they'll make five or six out of 10. But the other ones are whacked five, six, seven foot beyond the hole. And that's wasting strokes. And that's got the knock-on effect into the mental area of the game too. Absolutely. I often see this with when I play in tournaments with collegiate players. They're so aggressive inside of eight feet. They're trying to ram it in the hole. And quite quite honestly, I've only seen one golfer in my lifetime who's been able to do that. Do you know his name, Mark? Tiger Woods. Exactly. He was the best putter ever. I mean, he went for years without not missing even, a four or five a footer. Yeah, it's not even a contest. And he, but he knew his face control was so impeccable with that putter that he knew he wasn't going to miss it. So he's like, I'm just going to take the break out of this and I know I'm going to hit my spot. The rest of us can't do that. So inside of 10 feet, I believe, yes, face control is important, meaning can you start the ball on your intended line? And of course, green reading is important. Uh, but speed is also super important inside of 10 feet to, to your point is that when you try and ram it in the hole, you're just making the hole smaller. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you have a right edge putt and you smack it, well, now the size of the hole goes from four and a quarter inches down to two inches effectively, because now those putts that settle, let's say on that 20, 30% right side of the, of the hole, because they're going so fast the, the term is capture speed. Those are going to lip out. Versus if you hit it with the proper speed where the ball might have stopped six to 12 inches past the hole. Now those have a chance to drop in on that side. Um, so, yeah, I mean, trying to ram putts in from inside of 10 feet, I, I don't think is a great strategy. <laughs> One of the great tournament putters of my, anyone would say so is Ben Crenshaw. And I've had the good fortune of spending time around him. And I'll never forget how he described putting. He held up his old 8802 and he took a T and was pointing on the face Sort of he goes, if I hit it there, that's not good. And if I hit it, yeah, there, it's not good. And I was like, whoa, this guy's pointing out a pinprick. <laughs> how his feel was. And he goes, but that's the spot if I hit it right there. So he goes, I'm just trying to hit the ball on that spot. That's all I'm trying to do. And then have the ball fall into the hole like a drunk sailor. I'll tell you what. It's uh, a good image of how the drunk yeah. sailor would fall over into the hole. It was awesome. I'm, I mean, as someone who is a dreadful putter, um, my emphasis is completely on speed and my pre-shot routine and everything. I think people obsess over the line way too much. Um, I use aim point just to kind of systemize that for me. I make my read really quickly and then I'm wholly focused on the speed of the putt in my pre-shot routine. And that has helped me so much because that gets me in a state where I believe I'm focused on the right thing. When I, when I focus on the line, I'm like, don't pull it, don't push it. You know, that, that has made me a far better putter. And I think most of the greats, not that I'm one of the greats, but I think most of the greats all had one thing in common is their speed control was out of this world. Well, the speed influences the line reading too. Um, it, it's a, it all comes together. Let's move the practice onto the, onto the hitting area, the driving range. Talk sure. a little about that. So I think, you know, there's a lot I talk about in the practice session. Obviously, we're not going to cover it all in the next five minutes. I think one thing I would like to just kind of let people know about is, is more of the what I would call the out of the box practice methods that I am a huge proponent of. Um, yeah. As a junior golfer, I used to play like a child. I used to do all types of wacky shots try and hit it low, high, phage, um, stuff that I'm sure you and your brother did as kids too. Um, mm. We're just playing and experimenting. And that, that I didn't know it at the time, but that was building my ball striking skills as a golfer. It was building my face control awareness. It was you're building. Sounding, you're sounding like Adam now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why Adam and I teamed up is because I think I, I have a very unorthodox way of how I've always approached sports and how I practiced. And I, I, I would figure things out with, I would be good at them, but my technique would look very unorthodox. My, my golf swing does not, you know, if you looked at my golf swing, you'd be like, you know, if I showed it to 10 swing instructors, I'm pretty sure none of them could accurately guess my handicap for a number of reasons. Um, but what I do believe I have are good skills. And Adam and I talk about that on our podcast a lot. I'm able to access the center of the face and control the face, which that's essentially golf. <laughs> if you can't do those two things, you're not, you're not hitting on target. Um, so the, the way that I think that 
and again, Adam, with his research into motor learning and his book, the practice manual, which everyone should read as well. Um, you know, when we kind of, when I found him, I'm like, oh my God, you know, those are, you know, he, he is teaching his students the things that I was kind of like stumbling on in the darkness in my own golf game and, and still to this day use. So that's why we have such similar philosophies on practice. And one of the things we often talk about is like getting outside of the box, doing experimental practice. So for example, um, if I'm someone who is a drawer of the golf ball, I will intentionally hit slices. I will intentionally hit different trajectories, not because I want to use those shots on the course, but because sometimes it helps neutralize my swing path with my draw. If I'm struggling with a hook, I try and hit a big fade. I call it my fight fire with fire practice method. You do the exact opposite of your fault and it neutralizes, I believe the inherent fault. Um, and these are the types of practice methods that I talk about in the book. And some people I think will read them and be like, well, that's a little crazy and weird. And I'm not suggesting everyone should devote all their practice sessions to these methods, maybe 10, 20%. Um, but I'm just trying to get people out of that, show up to the range, beat a bunch of balls. They're not paying attention. They're not looking at the proper feedback. They have no target. I call them zombie range sessions. And my goal in the practice session of the book is to give you a number of methods that you can try and give your practice sessions more structure, more meaning, more emphasis so that you can solve that problem that everyone comes to me with. I was hitting it so great on the range, but I stunk on the course. Yeah. It's bridging that gap. And I believe the methods that I've figured out and Adam has taught his players that we talk about a lot. I, I, I truly believe those can help players of all levels. If I may, folks, I just want to add to what John so eloquently put together there. Um, I've always maintained, I learned from Bob Tosky, he was on the show, he said, golf is a game of distance control and direction. I've always, <laughs> I've always maintained that golf is the ultimate game of spin. And when I use, when I throw the term spin at any golfer, they think of backspin. But it's about the ball moving on its axis and how it spins from side to side. Sure. And if you want to fix your ball flight trajectory, if you slice the thing, try and hook it. If you hook the thing, try and slice it. If you hit it low, try and hit it high. If you hit it high, try and hit it low. Because between those variations, the poles, if you will, that's where the ideal ball flight comes from. And that's building on what John was saying, the face awareness, the skill of uh, hitting quality or hitting the desired or re desired and required ball flight for, what's, uh, for, for what the shot demands. I believe I've gotten this question a million times is like, what, to, what did it take for you to become a scratch golfer? And the answer is when I think about ball striking skills is I got control of the face. You know, we now know that where the golf club is pointing at impact. Most important thing is the primary driver of where the ball starts. And when you think about, you know, you talked about distance control and, and, and that other stuff. Why was I, struggling. I hit my tee shots way too far left and right. I was losing golf balls. I wasn't hitting a lot of greens. My face control was horrible. It was either pointing way too open or way too closed. And that speaking with a ton of swing instructors who are way smarter than me, that's, they believe is the biggest variable. It's not the path of the club. It's matching up the face. If you can, you can play functional golf with pretty much any swing path. If you can control where that face is pointing reasonably well. And I'm a perfect example of that. Yeah, I've 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 shown good golfers Rory McIlroy's driver path numbers, and their crazy, eyes, yeah, and their eyes were spouting blood because if they saw those numbers, they'd think there was a problem. All right, uh, that's practice. Uh, so practicing outside the box, um, the mental game. We've sort of touched it, we've kissed it along the way here. Um, to me, everything flows from the control center up here. Talk a bit about <laughs> the fourth pillar. So the way I approach the mental game is I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sports psychologist. I don't have any psychology degree, but I have a lot of experience being a head case on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it. I think it's in the first or second chapter of my book. I, I tell a very horrible story about, I was on vacation with my dad and I, I broke a golf club in front of him and he walked off the course. I was in my mid twenties and that was really my low point in golf. Um, so I'm not here to tell people that I'm some monk that has it figured out. Um, I've had my struggles with my temper and stuff like that. 
I think I've got them mostly under control, but they show up from time to time. Mm -hmm. But the way I view the mental game is, is that how can you conduct yourself on the course? I think there are a few methods that a golfer of any level can pick up. And these are, you know, nothing revolutionary mindfulness, you know, that, that word gets misused a lot, just being aware of your surroundings, grateful to be there. You know, sometimes when I'm under pressure on the golf course, or maybe I'm having a bad round, I just start staring off into the distance. I look at the wind, the way it's blowing on the leaves or the way the sunlight's hitting the course. And I just say to myself, wow, this is a, this is a right. gift. Mm. This is a gift that I'm here right now that I get to do this. I, I could be elsewhere in the world doing something else. That's not as maybe I don't think it's that fun right now, but it really is. So there's this idea of, I talk about mindfulness and, and grateful, being grateful to be out there. I think those are part of a mental toolkit that a lot of people don't talk about, especially for the recreational player who's, we're supposed to be playing for fun. Um, so I view the mental game through the lens of not necessarily this ultra hardcore performance technique, like, you know, a PGA tour player to win a tournament, they need to access a wide range of tools to get their mind right. Yeah. Unbelievable pressure. Can't even fathom how hard it must be. And breathing is a big deal. Breathing yeah. Big deal. I talk about breathing a lot too. And I, I think you can do these things that maybe the tour players do on a much you know smaller scale. So I'm big on process. You know, everything I talk about in the mental section of the book is essentially leading up to a pre-shot routine. I believe in routine. I believe in having something that's personal to you where you are stepping up, evaluating your shot, picking the right target, going through a routine that gets you in an autopilot state, hitting, accepting the result and moving on. You know, I get questions like, how do I deal with first team nerves? How do I deal with not blowing it down the last four holes when I'm playing well? It's routine. You hang your hat on routine and you do your best to go through it each time give this shot the attention it deserves. And I give some methods, I believe how you can do that. And then in between where you have three or four minutes to think in between shots, are you having, are you having a good time with your buddies? Are you enjoying nature? Are you enjoying this experience rather than running around and being a maniac? Like I used to be and scolding myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I used to be a negative self-talker and now I'm a positive self-talker. So these are the types of things I discuss in the mental part of the book. There's a gentleman, his name is Dr. Kapil Gupta. He's been on the show a bit. I've actually got the book on my desk, A Master's Secret Whispers. And his son um, was a tremendous player, played at uh, Oklahoma State, in fact. And you were, you were talking about how you would just gaze off in the distance or be aware of shadows or sunlight and the gratefulness, that mindfulness out there, and how it can redirect and channel one's energy. He talked to me about how when you hold a golf club, feel how the rubber of the grip feels in your hands. Yep. And, and I've got a friend who's suffered from some anxiety here recently. Part of their recuperating, which they're doing, is you know, meditation in the morning, but doing so barefoot and just allowing yourself to ground with the earth. Yeah, and, I, and meditation's right, huge. Yeah, you're right, you're right out there on the golf course. You know, it sounds a bit airy-fairy, but feel the grass, rub, rub your hand along the, the putting green or whatever, and just that'll redirect your attention. And you'll find that you'll quickly get away from the mini meltdown you were having because you'd miss hit the seven iron on the previous shot. I, I, I'm not someone who meditates every day. I went through some guided meditations for a few months and, and learned those techniques where you're literally focusing on sensations that we take for granted, how oxygen is going through your nose and you're feeling that, where you said the sensation of the club in your hand or the way the hint, the wind is touching my face or the sun. Um, these are things that I try and draw on. I play a lot of tournaments. I feel a lot of pressure coming down the stretch. I'm controlling my breathing. I'm humming songs to myself. Sometimes they're my kids' songs that get stuck in my head. Sometimes it's a song on the radio. I often do it in my pre-shot routine with my putting. It just gets you, you know, we always talk about being in the zone. I don't know if it gets you in quote unquote the zone, but at least it can relax you and calm you down and get you out of that. Let's face it, golf can make you panic. And when you, you know, you make a double or triple bogey, you hit a driver out of bounds, things start to speed up. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You start sweating a little bit. I, I know what it feels like. It's not pleasant. Um, and I believe 
again, you, some of these techniques sound a little too good to be true, but they're really not. If you have the discipline to do them and be aware of them, I think it can really heighten people's experience. Yeah. Just to put things into context though, folks, um, these things aren't a guarantee for a lower score, but they guarantee, no. they're going to guarantee that they're going to put you in the headspace to be able to line yourself up to make that lowest score. In fact, you're stacking the probability in your favor as opposed to the other way around. That is literally everything I want to come across in the book. And I try and say is like, and I think a lot of other people figure this out in golf too. Nothing is guaranteed, you know, having a pre-shot routine, focusing your mind on, you're just trying to give yourself a better chance yeah. because this game is so variable. You have no control over so many things in golf. And the best we can do is, have some type of system and a toolkit we can access on the course that gives us a better chance of getting in a state to allow, I believe, our inner athlete and our skills to come out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I believe it gives you a better chance. That's the name of the game because this game is so hard that you can't guarantee anything. Preach, brother. I've got to say this um, for us oldies. A guy called Fuzzy Zella, multiple major champion, used to whistle in between every golf shot. In fact, he would whistle over the ball. Lee Trevino, I've talked with him about it. He would talk until the golf swing. He was talking into the middle of his backswing because that relaxed him. Yep. And there was one guy, Tiger Woods, that I've been out there on the course calling his stuff. And he'd be over the golf ball and quickly sort of pull away like this and have a look up at the trees. And I'd be like, what the hell is he feeling? Yeah. And behold, then there would be the breeze because he would, he'd be like so aware of himself, like if the little flutter in the shirt or the quick breeze on the cheek, stuff that we numb to when we panicked. And if you panicked, uh, to me, tension is the biggest wrecker of a golf swing that there ever has been. Yeah. Essentially, you're absorbing too much information at once. And everyone has a different trigger to calm them down. So if it's whistling or humming song, I, I, songs are big for me. I hum a lot of songs on the golf course. I play them in my head. It's very helpful to me. That might sound crazy to people, but I can't tell you how many times I've been down the stretch in tournaments where in the past I probably would have blown it because my nerves would have overtaken me where I was able to get myself in this calm state with music. I love music. I love listening to music. It's with me all the time. And I listen to it in the car on the way to the course. So I just, I allow it to come in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that could be different for everyone else, but you have to find that thing for you, I think. Is the reason why so many golfers warm up with their AirPods in their ears nowadays. Hey, you're a star. Um, again, remind the folks where they can find the book. Remind the folks where they can find you, the website, the social media and such, please. And the podcast name. Sure. Um, so the book is The Four Foundations of Golf, How to Build a Game That Lasts a Lifetime. I'm trying to, this is a teach a man to fish scenario, Mark. I want them to eat for a lifetime. Um <laughs> You can find that on Amazon, um, wherever you're located in the world, just search for foundations of golf. Uh, it's available in Kindle paperback and most markets hardcover as well. Um, fortunate to say it's the number one best-selling golf book on Amazon right now. I have, uh, I've dethroned the Phil Mickelson book temporarily. Maybe we'll see how long, uh, We'll leave that to another podcast episode, that topic. But, <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate it. If you read the book, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, you can find my website, practical-golf.com. The podcast I co-host with Adam Young, where I discuss a lot of these topics. It's called The Sweet Spot. And lastly, if you want to talk to me directly, I'm very active on Twitter, at Practical Golf. And it's John, J-O-N. Yes. Sherman. My, my real, my full name is Jonathan, but only my mother calls me that. Jonathan, you're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the guy, I always tell people I'm just a guy with an internet connection uh, and some well, opinions on golf. <laughs> well, you're using it, you're using it um with with lofty purpose in mind. And I appreciate you for it. Thanks for joining us again. Keep up the great work, man. Thank you for having me on. It's it's it, honestly it's always an honor to 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 be talking to you. It means a lot. It, it's it's a big deal to me, to be quite honest with you. So thank you for having me on again. Mm -hmm.